Oh, happy day. Welcome to the chicken box. Hey, I hope you're having a great day because somebody didn't wake up this morning and you are awake if you're listening to the chicken box broadcasted from the Afro-American newspapers. Facebook page, 129 years of informing, inspiring, and educating and uplifting the African-American community. We have a great show for you today. I'm Kevin Impeccable Peck, your co-host, along with my beautiful other co-host, Dr. Draper and Nisha Green, DC editor. I represent the Gen Xers. For all of the Gen Xers out there, we hanging in there, fellas and ladies. But uh, <laughs> uh, Misha, how are you today? I'm, I'm going to bounce down to you since you you know, had Starbucks and didn't share it with anybody virtually. I'm so sorry. And, and if Starbucks uh, was sponsoring us today, oh, yeah. right. <laughs> I would for sure be be repping. But I apologize to you all. I'm going to be sipping my my Starbucks uh, during today's episode. But I I'm doing well. I'm feeling great. And, you know, I have to rep represent for my uh, millennial boomers out there, or is it boomer millennials, excuse me, um, like myself. And um, I'm really excited to talk about today's subject. This is, uh, I think, a topic that people will get to learn a lot about uh, and want to do more research, which is always really exciting to me. And we have an expert on today's show, so I'm really excited. Absolutely. Dr. Draper? Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, depending on where you're tuning in from. Welcome to the Chicken Box. And so if Misha's representing the Boomer Millennials, I'm re representing the Millennial Boomers. And a recent um, AARP study said that 70% of this country's wealth is controlled by people 55 and over. So let's give a shout out to the Boomers who control the wealth. Of wow. still control, still control the world. That's a that's another whole show. But I'm so glad to be here um, with you, Misha and Kevin. Um, this is really is going to be an exciting show. So I can't wait till we get started. This is a chicken box, y'all. If you're from Baltimore or the Baltimore metropolitan area, maybe you've heard of one. It's four wings, fries, salt, pepper, ketchup, a half and half. Oh well, why am I calling it a half and half? Is it a half and half? Yeah, it is it's a half and half. half. In some parts of the country, they call it an Arnold Palmer. But Arnold Palmer actually won his first major in Baltimore. So he may have gotten the drink there and then, you know, changed the name. Anyway, that, a lot of that has happened throughout history. But we're here to talk about Black people versus the 688. That's right, 6 and then 888. A lot of you guys might not know what it is, might not know what we're even talking about. But we're going to get into it so that maybe you can learn something. Do me a favor. if It's a little button that, that looks like an arrow. And... Just hit the share button because somebody is going to learn something that they didn't know anything about today. We all know the Afro family has been part of history since 1892. And during the World War II, we were covering it as members of the Afro on the front lines. We had a family member that was one of the 850, the 800, I'm sorry, and 55 hidden figures in World War II history. They were all in the black group of women. 855 women who saved the postal battalion aboard uh, aboard in the Second World War. Before even getting into this 6 triple eight, Dr. Draper, can you tell us more about how the Afro's family had a connection to the 6 triple eight? It's funny. It, it says it's funny saying it. it. It's it's like almost a tongue twister. It's the 6 triple eight. Before the end of the show, we're gonna get it, and well, everybody gonna it. know what the 6 triple eight is. And I think it's the six triple eighth, if you want to be really particular about it. But I'll guess. Okay. Uh, well, I'll get, and it's more to the title too. But you're right; people do say six triple eight. We asked about the Afro's connection, Kevin. You said a little bit about it. We did have World War II correspondence um, in Europe, but we also had, oh, and we also had a member uh, of the six triple eighth who was a, a member of the Afro family daughter of Afro publisher Carl Murphy, and her name was Vashti Murphy Matthews. She was married by then, and she was a, a member of that very, very um, important group of folk. But you know what? They, The person who really should tell us about it is our guest for today, Kevin. So I think before we get there, um, I, you know, before we go any further, I, I'd love for our guest to come. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Welcome, Colonel Edna Cummings. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Welcome, welcome to the Chicken Box. Oh, glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. We are on Facebook, so if you're on Facebook or any groups that you're in, feel free to share. Um, Misha, why don't why don't you did, did we give her a proper Afro Chicken Box intro? <laughs> I, I don't think we did here. Every now and then, you need a virtual hug and a virtual smile just to help you get through it. But uh, one of the one of our ladies, can you please give her a proper intro? <laughs> Well, I, I can give give a little bit, and then Dr. Draper recently was even sharing more information uh, uh, that I didn't know about uh, Colonel Cummings. So I'll give a little bit, and then if Dr. Draper wants to add some fun facts about her as well, then of course we have the expert here. So for sure, please correct us if we're wrong, share things with us, Colonel Cummings, as well. But yeah, we are very thrilled to have Colonel Etna Cummings on today's show. Cummings has led efforts for honor, honoring and commemorating the 6th Triple Eighth, having met with members of Congress and staff. In early 2019, she served as a producer for a documentary titled The 6th Triple Eighth that tells the battalion's story. And so, of course, I think we're gonna hear a little bit more about that today. Uh, and according to Military Officers of America, Cummings connected with the story of the 6th Triple Eighth and, uh, and particularly commanding officer Charity Edna Adams, who rose to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel, an achievement unheard of for a black woman in the military at that time. She's been working tirelessly to ensure that those women are known and honored ever since. And we are so happy to welcome her on the chicken box. So thank you so much, Colonel Cummings, for being here. Oh, thank you, it's an honor. And this is an interesting show. I'm excited to uh, participate. So thanks again. You like chicken? Colonel. Oh, I love chicken. <laughs> <laughs> you just had to check, check your temperature to see where you were on chicken. Oh yes. Uh, well, how do you how do you like it? Fried, grilled, air fried? I'm a grilled chicken. The older I get, the more grilled I go. But every now and then, I sneak a fried two piece. You know, just came from Carolina actually, so I have my choice of chicken places. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I, yeah. I think I think I hope nobody's hungry because as soon as you start hearing about chicken, you thinking about lunchtime that you might want to want to you you put two piece in it. I mean, <laughs> as soon as you say two piece, it just makes you smile. Um, but you know, it's been a lot of stereotypes with the chicken box um, that that we go into about black women in the armed forces. Misha, uh, I don't know, Colonel. Have you heard? I'm gonna let her run down the list maybe and see if you heard any of these stereotypes. Uh, about just black women in the military. Oh, wow, well, the, the stereotypes. Well, let me just start with the stereotype with the military in general, and then we'll add the element of being a black woman because there are so many stereotypes. People join the military because you cannot get a job anyplace else. You join the military because you have all this hidden rage and you want to release it someplace. And then if you're a woman, you either join because you're looking for a partner. I'll just leave it at that. Or you just have some desire to prove that you are as good as anybody else. And few people ever talk about joining the military for opportunity, chance to travel, education, skills, and a relatively decent quality of life. Um, so those are some of those stereotypes that were true in World War II, true now. So that has not gone away, especially for some of our transitioning soldiers. Uh, we get a lot of feedback. I've heard a lot of feedback that employers want to make sure that they can function around people who are not in the military, forgetting that uh, military people have families, they have you know, mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, they're just regular people who wanted to serve their country for various reasons. Absolutely. We we even uh, at the Afro, we call it the digital streets now because now, mm -hmm. you know, we, we're more digital now. Mm -hmm. Misha, I, I have her scroll the, the digital streets. What, what have you heard on those digital streets, Misha? Well, uh, Colonel Cummings has hit the nail on the head. Obviously, she's she's been hearing these uh, stereotypes probably for the past I don't know, a few decades at this juncture since she's had a, a storied and uh, 
a very, very successful career in the military. Uh, but the, the digital streets are really, really hard on black women, uh, particularly in the armed forces. Uh, so th these are all just people's stereotypes. Again, I must emphasize these are not opinions from the Afro. We're not stating any facts here. Uh, but I, I found that people said black women did not serve in wars until the late 20th century. Uh, black people only, or black women, excuse me, only did domestic work, work during wars. Uh, black women are not even uh, appreciated in the United States. And so why are they uh, serving in the armed forces? Black women are taken advantage of in the armed forces. Black women uh, were too important at home to serve in the armed forces. Black women are disrespected. Black women cannot rise in the ranks very quickly, which I'd love to hear Colonel Cummings talk about. Uh, and black women get things done and are key to the functioning of the armed forces. So not all negative. The last one was was pretty uh, complimentary of black women in the armed forces. But people give black women in particular a really hard time in, in the digital streets about uh, joining one of uh, joining the military. Absolutely. Um, Colonel, have you heard any of those that she named? I mean, you, you pretty much, your list was, was a solid list, by the way, but, but, but we were just telling you what, what we were hearing before you came on here. Yeah. Not only have I heard, read about it, I've been confronted with it. I'll never forget I was in uniform on the Metro, and this maybe was the late 90s I was working, maybe at the Pentagon, I'm not sure. And this woman just approached me and just like, you leave your babies and go to war. How could you? And I just looked at her. And we we're taught, especially in the D.C. area, not to engage because we've had to walk through protest lines. I've had to walk through protesters. And just to be confronted, the woman did not know anything about me. But she automatically assumed that, um, you know, I was just I had kids, which I did. And I didn't say anything. Um, Post-military, similar experience. I applied to for a job, will not get specifics. And the uh, interviewer mentioned, she says, I don't know if you can relate to the workforce. And I'll leave that in open terms. She says, because sometimes you need to come in, you know, with a carrot instead of a stick. Mm -hmm. I paused for a moment. And um, I have an expression of speaking in tongue internally, if you all know what I mean sometimes. <laughs> when you are struggling for the words, you know, trying to be professional. And I said, first of all, ma'am, I am a mother. And I said, people believe the military is this big dictatorship. But in order to get people to lead, you have to motivate them. You cannot motivate uh, people by being harsh and nasty and disrespectful. It is not a dictatorship. We have more collaboration in the military than I think people understand. Now, ultimately, once the decision is made, after you've studied the problem, discussed it, and developed courses of actions to do whatever you need to do, then, of course, just like any other organization, you get together, you talk about it, and then you decide what uh, you're going to do. And so, yes, there's an element of dictatorship, for lack of a better term, but what organization does not have that? Dr. Draper, I'm sure you listen to your people, but when you make up your mind, ultimately you make, you know, you have the final call. So it's a lot more rigid. The mission is different than other, you know, organizations. But yeah, we, we talk to people. We really do. <laughs> My favorite line was, do not engage. <laughs> do not engage. Yeah. You know, let me let me uh let me to interpret interpret that if you just tune in. Don't 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 uh don't make me whoop your butt. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> do not engage. If you just tuned in, this is the chicken box. We're talking to Colonel Edna Cummings. Um, she's on uh with us as we talk about black people versus the six triple is it eighth or eight? Would We'll go with six triple eight. That's easy. It rolls off the tongue a lot better. Six triple eight. Six triple eight. And and though you may have never heard of it, I think maybe we need to take a step back mm -hmm. and and give 
I, mean, I could be going off script, but to give some history about that, Dr. Draper. Or well, that. you know what? I think that Colonel Cummins, really, <laughs> um, she's led this charge to make uh, the women of the trip, uh, six triple eight uh, more well known around the the world, really, for their contribution. I want her to tell us about what they did during World War II, which is remarkable. There are only about seven of them still living. But here's why it's relevant today. Yes, that was World War II. It's relevant today because there's legislation pending for these ladies to finally get recognized by way of a congressional gold medal. And it's really close. And so thanks to all who've tuned in um, to the Chicken Box. Come on and share this broadcast. You don't want to miss what she's getting ready to say about um, the six triple eight and all of the efforts right now. Carl Cummins, come on, give us a quick, like, not don't have to be quick either. Give us a history lesson around this. Tell us about the effort. Tell us how we can help. Um, tell us about these amazing, amazing black women. Yeah. Well, I like to set the backdrop. So you think at the end of the Depression, you know, late 30s, um, women, people, America, recovering from extreme poverty and World War II breaks out. So World War II, um, you had a war going on in the Pacific, you had a war going on in Europe, and you had a small war going on in what's called the CBI, China Burma Indian Theater. So that's why it's a world war. People, you know, everybody's fighting everybody, trying to quit quell the dictatorship that we talked about of Hitler and the spread of the Nazi regime, among other things. So there was a call to arms recruiting for people, you know, throughout the uh, United States, men, and to include women. Uh, to join the service. At that time, the military had was segregated by race and gender. You didn't have women in the military uh, as part of the main military. They were part of a separate corps. The army had the most, the Women's Army Corps, and then you had the men who were segregated by race. Units like the Tuskegee Airmen, you've heard a lot, they could not be in fully integrated into the uh, armed forces. And because of this war college study back in 1925 that said Blacks were inferior, this is post-World War I, Blacks are inferior, they can only do menial tasks, their brain is smaller, cannot you know, perform at a senior level, and they're only suited basically to do what you mentioned earlier, scrub floors, uh, housekeeping, you know, manual labor. And so that was a national effort, I think, within the Black community to prove that Blacks could serve as well as their white counterparts given the proper training. So fast forward to World War II after this study, uh, need a manpower, you know, blacks were recruited into the military. And like I said, you've heard of the Tuskegee Airmen, Montfort Port Marines, but the women were not included, the black women. So in 1942, uh, thanks to the efforts of Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune and El First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, you hear a lot about Eleanor Roosevelt uh, advocating for the Tuskegee Airmen. But what I did not know until I really started uh, working on the 6888 is that she also advocated for Black women to join the military in meaningful roles. So during World War II, there are more than 6,000 Black women in the United States serving our nation. And of that 6,000, 855 were handpicked to go to Europe. Units of white women were going to Europe um, and Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune said, hey, we need to give Black women the opportunity to serve like their white female counterparts. So for women in the Army, they started out with the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps in 1942. And a Black woman, Charity Edna Adams, was the first Black woman to receive her commission as an officer. Their first class at Fort Des Moines had about uh, 40 black women going through um, officer school. So in, in 42, uh, Charity Adams and 
it's interesting, her name began with A, so not only was she was the first black woman, I believe she was the first woman just because of her last name, became an officer and worked throughout the United States with the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. So with the ramp up of World War II, um, mail became backlogged because during wartime, everything is manual. The only way people communicated the primary method was through mail. So you have all these troops, about 7 million Americans, about 3 million troops, uh, give or take a few million, a uh, few thousand rather, over the course of the war, not receiving mail. And it just became backlog and backlog. So just think for a moment, if you don't receive a text or an email from someone you care about throughout the day, how you feel. So you, mo you think about millions of people not receiving communication from their loved ones, or they send a letter and it doesn't make it. It became a big problem. And the Army is the uh, organization that maintains the mail during wartime, in World War II. They call it the executive agent or the person in charge. And it says, all right, we got a problem. Other units have been over there trying to clear this backlog of mail. They failed. And so 855 women in the Army um, were handpicked. They had to go through, undergo psychological training, uh, rigorous testing. So you have women who are school teachers. Some have professional jobs, and some did have domestic uh, positions assigned to go to Europe with no formal training in postal operations, had no clue where they were going, it was a secret mission. When they actually went to Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia, um, no one really talked about them being there. So think of classified operations. They were on the classified mission. The commander didn't know where she was going until she got on the plane and was told, don't open this envelope until you get on the plane. It's almost like Mission Impossible, when you know he gets the envelope and says, all right, you've been assigned a mission, you cannot open it, and then you have to destroy it once you read it. You know, it, it was something like that. She got on the plane, opened this envelope, the plane was on the way to Europe. They get over there, warehouses full of mail, about 17 million pieces roughly in Europe alone, in airplane hangars, dark, dirty, cold, blackout conditions because the you know, war was still going on. Um, infested with all kind of rodents and creatures. And they left in early um, February, 1944, sailing over German U-boats. He was still at war, chasing the ship. They get there, a bomb exploded. Women had to run for cover. As soon as they get to uh, their assignment in Birmingham, England, uh, they have to march called pass and review. So here you are, nine days at sea, being chased by German U-boats. A bomb explodes when you get off the uh, ship. And oh, by the way, in a day or so, you got to march and look good doing it to prove that you have a right to be there. So in a nutshell, that's the story of the 6 8 They went over there. The Army says, OK, troop morale is low. Soldiers losing their troops, are losing their will to fight because it's more than just Army. So we got to figure this out. The commander set up a highly efficient system where she processed, but the unit processed 65,000 pieces of mail per shift. That equates to 195,000 pieces of mail and packages per 24-hour period. And within three months, you can multiply 195,000 by 90 days. That's roughly... 17 million pieces of mail and packages in Birmingham, England alone. So that doesn't you know, justify an award for the Congressional Gold Medal. I don't know what does. Um, I got involved early 2018 with the 9th and 10th Cavalry Buffalo Soldier Association of Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. We erected a monument to honor these women and the uh, Murphy family was there. Murphy Matthews family you know, attended. And while after we erected the monument, Senator Jerry Moran from Kansas, home of the Buffalo Soldiers, attended. And he had also uh, worked to do a, a Senate resolution for the 6 8 
He helped us get a meritorious unit commendation for our veterans out there. That's a unit award because they never received any type of recognition for their service. You know, when they returned, just came home and they went back and got married, civilian jobs, some of the women stayed in. So while working on the monument, a producer who had uh, released a documentary about World War I women who had similar challenges, these were white women, the Hello Girls, a Signal Corps unit, uh, that's communications who put millions of calls through and they never got any recognition. They weren't considered as veterans. So it's a pattern of behavior that the armed forces, because of the gender segregation, that did not recognize women as veterans. Fortunately, 6888 were recognized as veterans, but they didn't get the respect and honor until years afterwards. So we interviewed about seven women uh, who were living at the time for the documentary. We got invited to the United Kingdom as guests of the U.S. ambassador uh, who dedicated a blue plaque at the King Edward School in Birmingham, England. And the story just continued to grow through the documentary, through the efforts of um, our team to introduce this Congressional Gold Medal. And so we did that in 2019. The Congressional Gold Medal passed the Senate, actually, in 2019. Then COVID hit, didn't make it through the House. So now the bill has passed the Senate twice. And we're about 56 co-sponsors away, which translates into votes to getting it through the House of Representatives. So in a nutshell, yes, they were Black women, but let's focus on their accomplishments. They did something that no one else could do to get the job done and restore troop morale during World War II. So that's a brief walk through history. In about man, five. oh man, oh man, that was that was. If if you could just sit back right. and just, I could see the movie. I saw the visual, y'all. This is Black people versus the Six Triple Eight. We have Colonel Edna Cummings, um, U.S. Army, with us, sharing the story and the fight that she has been pushing for to get the recognition for these black women. I heard you say a couple of things. One, they had 17 million pieces of mail, not emails. You know how you, you, you just see the number on your phone of how many emails you have. They had 17 million. Then they had to go in there with the rats. But the morale had to go up because all those beautiful black women got off the got off the boat, That's, and the morale <laughs> automatically, <laughs> fellas, went up. <laughs> so yeah. the morale actually, I, I know it definitely went up. But and then yeah. it was amazing. Uh, this is this is for the fellas, ladies. Women will go through your mail. Okay, they're going. <laughs> they they're did. Gonna go through your mail, and they're gonna go through fast. So while you watching the game, <laughs> they're reading. So pay attention, fellas. Anyway. Right. Uh, welcome to the Chicken Box. We have our Jules, Toya, uh, Bonnie, uh, let's see, Chippy. Everybody, thank you for coming. This is a, a wonderful story, um, just like when I first heard about the Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, the, these are unknown hidden figures who throughout history, we continue to make an impact. And when they need the job done, who do they call? Black women. Black women. <laughs> Tell me, listen. I hate to say that, bro. Black <laughs> women get it done. That's right. We figure it out. That's exactly what happened because you read uh, the commander gave them roughly 30 days to figure out who would get this piece of mail. They were open up the mail and just do the little detective work uh, to try to track down who this mail belonged to. And this is so weird. Decades later, we were at an event at uh, Fort Maya called Twilight Tattoo. And this veteran approached one of the women and said, you're the reason I'm here because my parents hadn't heard from my father for a long time. And then he started getting all that mail. And when he came back home, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I talked about Birmingham, England, but these women also went to France. They went to Rouen, France and Paris and did the same thing, not the same volume. And tragically, uh, three lives were lost in a vehicle accident in Rouen, France. There's a famous parade, the Joan of Arc Parade in Rouen, France in May when they left uh, Birmingham, England. And there are only four women buried at Normandy American Cemetery. Three are from the 6888. One of our national landmarks, I released an article on medium.com talking about where some of these women are buried. There are 14 in Arlington National Cemetery. 
I just found this out um, a few months ago, going through Find a Grave. There's a virtual cemetery this lady curated and been so busy just to slow down to see what happened to these women. So findagrave.com, look up virtual cemetery 6888, and you will see where these women are. 14 in Arlington Cemetery, eight in Quantico. So you have these clusters of black women in these national landmarks. Nobody ever talks about it. So hopefully when the Congressional Gold Medal pass, Arlington Cemetery on their website will list the 6888 in their notables. So when you visit some of these land, you know, the uh, Arlington Cemetery, you can stop by and pay your respect to this group of black women who made it possible for me to serve and a lot of men to serve because I get a lot of emails from grandsons and nephews. So it's just not about creating a legacy for black women. It's about creating a legacy for people uh, because they did so much with little resources segregated by race and gender. And what I also learned that while the 6888 was in uh, Europe, they experienced a lot of freedoms once they left the installation, they were free to go to Paris and shop. But the black women in the United States were being beaten and spat on. I actually know a World War II veteran, she's 102 years old, wasn't in the 6888. And I read about some of the things she encountered. And to answer your question, why would a black woman serve in a unit like that or in the military? Her response to me, and I'll never forget it, she says, you know, yes, I did have some challenges and yes, I was spat at, but there was a lot of kindness I experienced too, because there were people and I experienced that as well, you know, white males and white women who saw what I had to go through and reached out and I call it provide me top cover, you know, that mentor and guidance to the mentorship and guidance to help me navigate a system that appeared to be, you know, against everything that you are trying to accomplish. So it happened in the 40s, you know, and it's still happening now. Wow. Absolutely. Go ahead, Dr. David. I was just thinking, I said, if I, if we didn't think Facebook would zap us, we, we, I'd love for our viewers to see the trailer from the documentary. Um, so, Kevin, I don't know if you have that. I don't know if we can show it either. Oh, yes. well, we'll, show, we'll show it at the end, just in case. Right. Oh, we can show it at the end. Well, that, that's right. good. But I also want to recognize that my cousin Betty Schuler is on, and she is, um, her mom is the one that we talked about from the Afro family that served in the 6888. And so shout out to you, Betty, hey, as Betty. well. And Hey, Betty, you're supposed to be on the show. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I <don't laughs> that's right. Tell yeah. this story. Yeah. And in that Matthews family. And so mom was a part of the, Six triple eight. Dad was in the Coast Guard, and Betty helped me. I think at least three of their five children were military, both enlisted and um, civilian. One rose to the ranks of lieutenant colonel. You know what, um, Colonel Cummings? Thank you for that story. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. How many women are still alive from the six triple eight? We know of seven, and one uh, major Fannie McClendon, interesting, when she came from Europe, she joined the Air Force, a retired Army major in 1971, blazed all types of trails in the Air Force, turned 101, so shout out to her, she's in uh, Tempe, Arizona, if you go online, you'll see her parade, the Arizona National Guard gave her parade, she got over 500 letters, and I actually spoke with her last night. And I said, I bet you thought you were back in England sorting through the mail. She said it took her three days to go. She's going through every piece of mail, just like she did probably in 1944, you know, 45, 45. Mm -hmm. Going through every piece of mail. Remember when the coupons used to come, y'all? And they used to be in the mail and yeah. you used to just cut them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The two officers and one civilian in the Matthews family. Betty, you need to just come on here. We're not going to read all your texts. Come on on. <laughs> that's how you can talk to family. I'm sorry. Y'all. Anyway, this is well, we're going to shout out Betty because she did. She did try to come, but I think she's working. So thank you for working and tuning in. I hope we don't get you drunk for saying that on, on live either. But thank you so much for, for even being on the show today. We really appreciate or tuning into the show today. We really appreciate it, Betty. And we found this uh, as 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 you guys were talking. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about this, Dr. Draper? Well, so this is from um, a March third, nineteen forty-five edition 
of the Afro, and it has some members of those who um, were in, is it the Women's Army Corps, Colonel? Cumberland? Right, the Women's Army Corps. It was, it was Women's, Army Women's Army Corps. Army Corps. Right. And all the way to the far right is Vashti Murphy Matthews, uh, who was a member of the 6 triple eight. And so these other women, um, I, the, the, I can't read it all there to know whether they were part of 6 triple eight or whether they yes. were. They were. They all, they're all a part of the six triple eight. You have to really. I'm glad when we show this at the end to see how they lined up and how they. I mean, these ladies were soldiers. Their detail was to the mail. That's what the job was, which was so important. What was their um, theme, um, Colonel Cummings? Um, no mail, no morale, or low morale, or. Yeah, no mail, low morale. Yeah, that was their motto, just kind of grounded them in their mission. You know, we got to help our troops win the war. If they don't feel happy, if they're not happy, you know, the war will not be won to defeat, um, you know, Nazi Germany. So. Absolutely. So, so the Afro has these pictures of these, uh, of these ladies um, who were now, they were overseas, I think, when these pictures were mm -hmm. taken. And so yeah, the one in the middle, that's before, they were in New York at the time. I'm familiar okay. with that one. That, they were in New York at Camp Shanks before they deployed, before they got on the boat to the Ile de France to go to Europe in February 1945. So that was a pre-deployment photo of some of the women. And I must say the Afro is a primary reference for articles about the, for information about the 6888. Um, while I speak to members of Congress, I had a list of the women in the states that I came from, and I just kept getting these questions. Were they from my district? What city? And after digging uh, through some of the Afro archives on Pratt Library, I was able to locate more than 700 names of the women and their cities, which made a big difference in getting co-sponsors. And throughout a lot of books, you'll see the Afro uh, name listed, you know, as a reference. And we also were able to find, I believe, about six or seven additional women because we had on the back of the monument at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, I believe there's uh, some names missing, 855 women we could not locate because records are destroyed and the manifest. So between the Afro archives, we were able to get some more names of, um, yeah, there it is. They're perfect. I send that every... I think every office in Congress has this list where they can look and see, hey, all right, she's from my district. And when I send emails, I go District 5, you know, Missouri, District 1, you know, wherever, by city and state. And that that's helped a lot to uh, get but You know what, um, Colonel Cummins, it almost mm -hmm. seems like a no-brainer. I mean, the Senate passed right. it unanimously, right? That's you right. Know, what, how can those of us watching, how can we help to push it over the finish line? And what seems to be, is there opposition to it? I mean, what's, what's happening with why we don't have the House um, fully behind this bill so we can get this Congressional Gold Medal for, for the 6 triple eight? I think the House is behind it. And I asked the same question. What's taking so long? I thought it should have passed a long time ago, of course. And it's education, not opposition. Thousands of bills okay. in the House to be considered. And right now they're working on continued resolution. Last year it was COVID and just so much is going on. You have to get their attention. And what I really like uh, readings when I send an email to uh, some of the staff members, they say, thank you for thank you for flagging this. We had no idea. And I want to respond, what do you mean you didn't have any idea? But it just takes Senate 100 members, the House 435. And so it's, it, it's, it's a lot of daily activities and national events uh, for them to go through. So I'm pleased that we have come as far. Uh, we got endorsements by some of the major military organizations, Association of U.S. Army, any Army folks in, on, online. I'll, I'm presenting there on October 11th. So you can go to AUSA, the Military Officer Association, the Hispanic Caucus, uh, most members from the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, the Women's Army, uh, the Women's Memorial, the, uh, the Women's uh, Army 
uh, Foundation, the Army Women's Foundation, uh, SWAN, Service Women Action, Action Network. So a lot of organizations have sent letters of support. And as someone told me, yeah, it's, it's a marathon. I have a great mentor, uh, I call him my gold me medal mentor uh, from the Marines, Moffin Port Marines, this uh, gunny sergeant, master gunny sergeant. Oh, he is incredible, Joe Jeter. So hello to all the Marines out there. You all are really helping me a lot. I ask them for support to show up. They show up in numbers for events. And he has really guided me and helped me a lot because he went down this path. And I was told it takes sometimes two to four years for these gold medal bills to go through it's because you have to educate the uh, members of Congress about the impact. So it's not enough just to be a black woman or a black male. What were your accomplishments? So hopefully you understand why the 6 triple eight is so significant despite <laughs> being a female. And that was the biggest discriminator. And then as black women um, to perform above and beyond what was called of them and to have such an impact on so many people's lives. Black women always go above and beyond in the community. And yes, they are mothers, they are bosses, they are CEOs, they are colonels in the army, and they are leaders and the backbone and the heartbeat of our community. Just look at Mother's Day, y'all. Yes, we have generals too now. Yeah. We, have some you got generals. Generals. we got generals, oh, presidents. Y'all yeah. we, 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 have it all. We listen. have publishers. publishers <laughs> listen. I'm, I'm just here in heavenly glory right now. Welcome to the chicken box, you guys. We're talking about Black people versus 6888, if you've never heard of it. These are the women who were not recognized for serving our country and, and solving a male problem, a set, not not a, a human being male. I'm talking about M A I L problem. But I guess when you said no morale, then then it's just like on a football game, right? And if if the men don't have the morale, they can't go out and play. So right. the ladies were able to do the male because the messages were getting home to their families to know that their loved ones were okay, that they were thinking about them. Somebody said they had a baby made. Those love letters must have been serious, y'all. There's no emails, no texts, no FaceTime. None of that was happening. The, 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 the mail was descriptive. The, it, it told how they felt, what was going on, how the conditions were out there. I'm sure all of the things that they wanted to say were on the backlog. And these ladies came and they cleaned it up and they made it happen. And the Afro not only had a family member who was there, but the Afro went on to have one of uh, the most documented, um, I guess, publication That's right. of, of the history. And if you guys just go to, um, let's see, if you just go to afro.com and hit archives, man, our archives go back to 1892. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, here's, here's not a shameless plug. Here's my plug, you guys. In order for us to have this kind of information for a hundred more years, we're going to need your support. So go to afro.com mm -hmm. and just get a subscription. Yes, nobody pays for our voice. Nobody owns our pages, our chicken boxes. <laughs> we come on and we're going to give you some information that hopefully you can share and that we can help each other and, and continue to grow this network. So that's afro.com for less than two Uber Eats. You can have it, $40 a year is digital. And if you want the legacy edition, yes, we still have paper because some people still like to hear and feel the paper. And sometimes it's a picture that's a keepsake that you may want to frame. Like I have the one when Obama got elected. But anyway, afro.com and we even have now added a text. So if you just text the word afro, making it easy you know it's not the bunch of mail that you got to go through like these ladies of six triple eight you can just pick your smartphone up text to 410-936-5002 afro and you will get connected man right i just sit here i'm ready for the special if they're not shooting it the afro media suite may consider this story uh dr draper well i think somebody's all, look um and colonel can tell us about it there is a movie in the works. I don't right. There's a move. There's a movie. Yeah, we we hope so. I was told it's Hollywood is very slow. But uh, ma'am, you were on the call with uh, one night in Miami actor Aldis Hodge. She's very yeah. interested in taking this uh, 
story to the big screen, but you know, it, it Hollywood is slow. They're maybe slower than Congress. So, <laughs> <laughs> but it, 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 you know, it takes a while, but I can say, I appreciate the Afro because when we started this journey with our team, with the monument, uh, the Afro was there. Edgar Brookings, a uh, longtime uh, employee, consultant, you know, friend of the Afro, uh, he helped me navigate. He was my PR person formerly. He helped, you know. And once the Afro started publishing stories, the word started getting out. It helped us carry the message. We've had coverage by just about every major network, you know, the CNNs, the NBCs, the CBS, all the alphabets. But before any of them came to listen, the Afro was the voice of the 6888 early on. So I cannot thank uh, Edgar Brookings and the Afro for being there from the beginning. I mean, even in World War II, chronicling the history, because as we know, if we don't tell our history, we cannot rely on other people to tell our history the way it should be told. So I appreciate the Afro for many years of support. Thank you. That is so true. And Can I jump in, Dr. Dre, because a lot jump, of people jump might in. not know uh, of what the Medal of Honor is or the Congressional Gold Medal that we are going for is would would somebody like to jump and explain or I can explain what the definition is on the on the screen. Tell me. Oh, I can give a brief definition. Just it's the nation's highest civilian honor, period. Civilian meaning non-military. So the highest award that you can get for valor is given to um, people and organ institutional organizations who have contributed to our nation. I mean, you have Rosa Parks, Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King, you know, military units all have received the Congressional Gold Medal. The first recipient was George Washington. And I just think it's so important that the 6888 is part of that legacy that will secure their legacy in history. So that's another reason why, you know, we are fighting so hard uh, to get this honor bestowed on the 6888. And on top of that, women, because they were separate units, the only other women's unit is the women's air service pilot. And they were not considered veterans until years later. So when the 6888 receives Congressional Gold Medal, it will be the only female unit in the veteran status or in the military status to receive this award. So I think that's... Uh, something that's remarkable because the women's, the military was integrated in 1948 by Harry, you know, Harry S. Truman president. The Women's Army Corps was not deactivated or disbanded until 30 years later in 1978. Wow. So in terms of separate, separate but not necessarily equal, you had uh, a military that was not open to women, but now, you know, thanks to, you know, the uh, act that integrated, you know, women, you know, women could then attend military academies. That didn't happen until the eighties. And well, I'm sorry, till the seventies, you know, the first graduate, you know, in the eighties. So I always tell people, I said, gender segregation <laughs> was a larger issue for me than the racial, because as a black woman, you have men of all races <laughs> saying, all right, we're not sure why you're here. You got to prove that you can do what I can do, if not better, in order to get my respect. And that did happen. Uh, I could connect to some of the stories that Charity Adams told, you know, wrote in her book, how she gained the respect of white males. I mentioned I've had white males to come back and apologize to me. So mm. we're sorry that uh, we gave you a hard time, but you're a damn good officer. So now you have our respect. So I'm like, all right, you made me go through hell and back three or four times. Now, <laughs> you know, now I have your respect. So that's what I mean by working twice, the, you know, twice as hard for sometimes half respect and no respect. And I just wanted to add mm -hmm. one of the really funny things that I noticed during mm -hmm. my research about the 6888 was how good these women looked. And I know that that is mm -hmm. completely not what you're supposed to I'm do. glad you said it, because I would have been on, it was throwing <laughs> nice of- They were hand-picked, remember that. Yeah. The Army PT, they had to work out, running boots, marching heels. 
I mean, it's just truly amazing. But mm -hmm. but I, I one of the first things I, I, I noticed was like their hair is like perfectly crimped and like they were working so hard seven days a week, eight hours a day and, and still doing all of this. I mean, really black women can, can do everything, but you were talking about how segregated they were and continue to be post uh, the integration of the US Army. And I remember seeing, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Colonel Cummings, but these women were also, I guess they were completely self-sufficient because they were segregated. So right. they had, they created their own makeshift hair salons. They created mm -hmm. their own mess halls for eating and, and were mm -hmm. cooking as well as doing the mail uh, and, and, and beating the odds and going above and beyond what the U.S. Army had even you know, seen or, or forecasted that they could do in, in three months. So, I, you know, I know we, we have been really giving black women props on, on all things, but I'm like, how y'all look good and, and work that hard? That is quite amazing. I mean, it was, it, it, it truly just shows the strength that black women possess um, in, in such a way that I, I think we really, really have to just continue uplifting and honoring them. Right, and they were, and they were soldiers. Let's not forget that they That's were still, right. they were still soldiers and they were in a war. Yeah. So it's not like they were in a, you know, some, some, some place off a base, some place just in a corner. They were in the middle of a world war and they were expected to be ready for war mm -hmm. as well. Right. And, That's they worked, right. and they worked around the clock shifts. Mm -hmm. So yeah. these, these 109, ladies, if you just tuned in, they were moving 195,000 pieces of mail a day. Right. They had a they had a backlog of 17 million pieces of mail. Yeah, those are the estimates, right? If you just think about it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you think about mm -hmm. your little bit of mail that comes to your mailbox, if you have one, uh, and and multiply that times a million. <laughs> the post office right. uses them now. The post mm -hmm. office. <laughs> so my, I have a quick question. Did, did the UK uh, citizens? treat you guys any uh, better than the American? Yeah, well, yes, uh, they treated the 6888 of uh, the feedback that we received from the women and as well as, you know, some of the historical uh, recollections, uh, they were rolled out the red carpet for a lot of the women. Um, and that, to me, that empowered them because leaving Jim Crow America, going to an environment that once you leave work, you have freedom of movement. I mean, they invited the six triple eight to their homes for dinner because uh, they were appreciative. And of course you had some incidents, but for the most part, the experience was so positive. We worked with an organization called Recognized. Um, that's a, a black heritage organization in the UK who's done a lot of research and just um, great stories and there's some pictures online about the six triple eight sitting down with uh british families uh eating and in the documentary talked about one of the women's historical archives saying we were free to go to perfume houses so i like to think that once they've tasted that freedom they came back to the u.s and fought even harder so on the front edge of civil rights um i read where some of the women refused these are the women not with the six triple eight refused to sit in segregated uh, bus stations. They ref and they were arrested. They refused to perform menial tasks at Fort Devens, Massachusetts. Uh, they were court-martialed. So you had this part of the double V campaign that the Afro documented, victory at home and victory abroad. Victory at home, the fight for democracy at home, and then the fight against uh, fascism uh, abroad. So the civil rights, the military has always been, I think, on the front end of uh, civil rights and social justice and equality because everyone has to meet the same standard. I mean, and once you do that, you've proven yourself. However, you still have to go above and beyond the standard. And that's what the 6888 did. They had to uh, go through, as I mentioned, overseas training at Fort Overthorpe, Georgia. And you're talking about them looking so great. I mean, that's, you know, wearing the protective mask, crawling under barbed wire. 
And one veteran who passed in 2020 mentioned that uh, while they were in England, they had trenches dug around. And those were the trenches they were supposed to jump in if you know bombs or artillery came in. But she said they were used for other purposes, you know, meaning latrines. And she says, well, I was not going to jump. <laughs> uh, she had some colorful I'm not jumping language. in the spotted pot. No. Right, no, right. No, no, uh, so, yeah, the outdoor <laughs> latrine. She's like, I wasn't jumping in that. So just a little levity sometimes. And uh, some of the women um, had custom made uniforms. They would go to the British tailors, you know, talking about why they look so good. They, you know, had custom made um, uniforms. And what I learned, the French invented, uh, I think, the Marcel curls, and that was popular. So they were in France. So they had access uh, to all sorts of uh, beauty, uh, leading edge, you know, beauty tips and, you know, the luxury of the French store. So can you imagine in the 40s, a black woman in Paris shopping and then coming back to the U.S. in Jim Crow? Those two, you're just like, I've had freedom. I'm not accepting that anymore. So a lot of these women went on to be you know, pioneers um, in, this, in the community for civil rights and really made an impact. One was the first Black woman to use a GI Bill to go to Winston-Salem State University, Elizabeth Barker from North Carolina. One lady also from North Carolina uh, was the first female president of the NAACP, Millie Dunn Vesey. Um, she passed, and the Congressional Black Caucus actually gave her an award, the A Voice Award, back in 2000, I believe it was 2018, either late 2018 or 2019. So these women were pioneers in so, so many ways uh, in the military and beyond. Hey, that is awesome. Guys, we are wrapping near the time. We probably could talk to you for, like, <laughs> for forever. Right. And, not, and not that we don't want to, because the, the <laughs> conversation it's so engaging. It just goes to show that sometimes you have to leave your environment right. to expand your mind and to expand your thinking. And, and it allowed them to, to, to push a vision past what they had known here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. just by going abroad. We know that the, right. we're all still going through a global pandemic. And I've, I, as you said here, I don't know if you, you know a guy named Perkins who plays the NBA because uh, LeBron just came on and he was talking about the vaccination. Wow. Uh, that he was vaccinated the other day at at press day, but uh, Perkins said that he he was hesitant. But when he found out that the military had to all be vaccinated and that they were protecting our country, mm -hmm. they were the ones who you know kept us safe at night, and they were all taking it. What is my hesitancy? Because America is awesome. not is not going to put their best soldiers out there who are protecting us uh, on the front line with some garbage in them. I know that that America is not into getting beat. In no, America. not at all. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, I just want to throw that out there. I hate to well, that, that's awesome. That's awesome. But sometimes to appreciate what you have, you have to step away. And that's one thing I thank the military because I've lived in Korea for a year and traveled abroad. And um, America is like a family, you know, you fuss with your family, you fight with them. But at the end of the day, you come home, you figure it out because that's your home. And I've had so many people, especially veterans, to say that, that, you know, despite everything else, I appreciate the military. It gave me a chance to appreciate what I have at home. So I'll, I'll stop there. It's a whole nother right. subject. Well, listen, we have, we have the trailer queued up. Yeah. Um, we didn't get on the chicken box. This is where we speak our truth about the mm -hmm. situation. All right, I'm going to go around to Dr. Dre and Misha and just say if 30 seconds mm -hmm. you have anything you that you have to speak your truth about this mm -hmm. subject, the 6 Triple Eight. My truth about the situation is that the 6 Triple Eight needs a congressional gold medal this year. And so if anybody's watching, check and see if your congressperson uh, in the House has signed on to this bill. Some, they like to hear from constituents. We, constituents, We're going to do our part. Colonel um, Cummins continue to do our part to push it. By Veterans Day, that would be what a gift, especially to these right. seven women who still are alive, who are between probably 95 and 102, to see this in their lifetime. I'm off the box. Misha Green. I just want to plug the fact that we have a new um 
program, I suppose, through the Afro called Afro News at Noon. And that launches this Monday first as a Facebook Live. So check us out Monday, October 4th. But our first Afro News at Noon story, which we'll always publish daily at noon, will be about the 6 oh, awesome. So make sure you tune into that. Uh, we really, really uh, want to ensure that the 6 AAA story gets out there and, of course, share this live. I'm also going to use, I'm sure I'm over 30 seconds, but I'm going to use the time to share the Afro fact because I thought it worked perfectly. Uh, and so this week's Afro fact is inspired by the October 5th, 1946 edition. And the headline read, Autos for, from U.S. for Disabled Vets. The article's photo shows two veterans, both from New York, one black and one white, receiving papers of ownership for their new automobiles. And these soldiers were the first disabled veterans of World War II to receive automobiles from the United States government. And this measure was possible thanks to a congressional act from two months before that allowed the government to provide such help for veterans. And they were the first two, but about 20,000 veterans were expected to receive vehicles around the nation. So that's this week's Afro fact, specifically related to World War II. Oh, awesome. Man, we have so many facts in that Afro archives. If man, we could spend a lifetime 130 years coming up next August, it's going to be mm -hmm. a big celebration, Colonel. We hope you can join us. Thank you. We're going to say thank you for not only for your service because we didn't thank you for your service, oh, thank, but thank you. you for being a trailblazer <laughs> and bringing the light, the big light, to the six triple eight. Uh, shout out to Fayetteville, North Carolina, absolutely. <laughs> in the building uh, <laughs> and so we're going to play this video right. so if facebook if they want to cut it shame on you anyway we're going to play it anyway <laughs> because the story needs to tell thank you everybody for tuning in go to afro.com let's see if we can get this thank uh, you for uh, can get thank this you. to play you guys most people have never heard of the 6888. We call it 6888 CPD. That's when I was overseas with 6888. We call it the 6888. In 1945, the only all-female, all-Black Army battalion was sent to World War II to clear a backlog of 17 million pieces of mail. They were victims of both racism and sexism from majority of from their leadership. Keisha Javis Jones is a Marine Corps veteran. Keisha, I hear that your grandfather had a connection to the 6888. So my grandfather served in World War II, and he used to tell me stories about receiving mail um, from their from his family and how that gave him hope uh, to return home. In 1943, General Eisenhower was up against a soldier shortage when he deployed the 6888 to England and France. How could 855 Americans go to World War II and their service just be forgotten? That is a very sad fact. And I will say that it is because they are African-American women. I sometimes wonder how much they, they don't really realize what role models they are. A documentary now honors the entire battalion service along with 11 surviving soldiers. White people never expected anything of us. You see, so when you got out there and did something that was extraordinary, they said somebody else must have done that. I think it would be a remarkable honor that these women are recognized while they are still living. Marine veteran Jody Grenier will screen the documentary online this Saturday with proceeds helping the Foundation for Women Warriors. The fact that we do still have women who live through sexism and racism says, yes, progress has been made, but not nearly as much as we maybe think there has been. Both Marines feel strongly the 6888 should be awarded the Congressional Gold Medal. I believe that with everyone's support, they will be honored. In the Zevely Zone, Jeff Zevely, News 8. Oh, wow. Why aren't you the landlord? Yes, you. What? Wow. Mm -hmm. Guys, we put the link in if you want to see it. This has been the Chicken Box. Have a wonderful day. Uh, and thank you, Colonel Cummings, Dr. Thank James, you. and Misha Green for hanging out with us and educating us on the 6888. All right. Keep informing Afro 129 years. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you.